this is a good time to resume our uh, series of webinars uh, in featuring patients and, and their stories. And we're very fortunate today to have uh, Ms. Haddon, who's uh, um, a delightful patient of us and willing to share the story. Again, these stories are, are unique um, because everybody has a unique story, but as, as we know, they resonate with a lot of other patients and there are messages for patients, for their families, uh, for, their, for their friends. And, and they serve the, the primary purpose of educating um, the, the patients, educating the physicians as well. Uh, and um, this is the objective here. There is no script. This is like a discussion. Um, usually, uh, we start with the patient's you know, background and story, and we'll interject as we go. On that note, Kelly Hansken is Hello. <laughs> here today. And... Uh, Ms. Hadno, thank you for doing this. We're thank listening. Thank you guys for having me. It's so nice to be here. Um, I watched so many, like everything that you had on your YouTube, I watched before I had my procedure with you. So these were like so helpful to me, just being able to hear that there were other people going and that have went through this with you was amazing to hear. So it really put me not at ease because I would have never been at ease no matter what I did, but I was, I felt better knowing that um, I could come on and listen to you and hear others talk about their story. So I love being here. Thank you guys for having me. Our pleasure. Do you want to start by saying the, when the symptoms started, what you felt like your journey, but I think this is like a, time to discuss this? Yeah. Um, so in May, uh, May of 2022, um, I remember I was at home and I bent down and I suddenly heard this really strange whooshing sound in my ear, but it was really only when I bent down um, that day. And for whatever reason, I thought that it was um, my earring was squeaking. So like I told my husband, I have to take my earrings out because like my earrings are making really weird noises. Um, and I realized that was such a weird thing to even say, but I was fully convinced it was my earrings making a very strange sound in my left ear. Um, and a day or two passed and I come to find out that it wasn't my earring. And instead of it just being when I bent down, the whooshing sound that I got in my left ear was constant. Um, so it came, it went from only when bending over to within 48 hours, it was constant. Um, and that's when like, I, I started freaking out, um, because, uh, I want to say a week went by and every day I would wake up and it wouldn't be any better. And I never heard of anybody having this before. So it was like, I didn't know what was happening to me. And I was really, I was really scared. Um, I didn't know all of the symptoms that I was having at that time was because of they were all connected. So not only did I have pulsatile tinnitus, which was the whooshing sound, um, I also had insane head pressure. Um, just going up a couple stairs would make my head feel like you could pop it with like a needle. Um, eating meals, I would get head pressure, like horrible, horrible head pressure. Um, I had a headache almost every single day that year, that school year. I'm a teacher um, and I would have terrible headaches and I really just thought it was normal. Like I just thought that everybody went through having horrible headaches. Like every teacher gets headaches. Yeah. Yeah. Like I was like, oh, okay, this is, this is my life. Like <laughs> it was just kind of normal for me. Um, and then the last symptoms, which I got, I realized that it was happening more and more um, was really bad eye floaters. Like I would see black eye floaters in front of my eye. Um, and those all were together at the same time. So the pulsatile tinnitus, I thought was really just a standalone thing. Like I didn't think that they all were connected. Um, and then I got my procedure done and it was like, I had none of those things anymore. So I realized just from that day of having it, I was like, all of these things are gone and nobody apparently lives like this. So it was eye opening to me to see that I, I was really suffering for a long time and I thought it was just my life. Like I thought it was just my body. Um, and I blamed myself a lot. Like I, I blame myself, um, 
for being overweight. Like I just, I blamed myself for everything that was going on. So it was like, I couldn't complain. So I didn't complain. Um, but I come to find out that it just wasn't, it wasn't what I thought it was. It was, it was all connected and I didn't have to live the way I was living. Um, my doctor journey was a little tough. Um, I had doctors really scare me, uh, because they don't know what it is. So Mm -hmm. I first started by going to a neurologist because I thought it was something to do with my brain. Um, and he basically said, I will give you an, a test called an MRA, which just looks at your arteries. And if that's fine, then you're just going to have to live with it. And it might just be like um, psychological. So as long as everything is fine with your arteries, like you don't have it, you're fine. Like that was it. Um, I found this page on Facebook very quickly into this. So within a couple of weeks, I found the um, page called the Wooshers page on right. Facebook. And my journey really shifted from there. Um, I found people to talk to about it. I found Dr. P and Kelly. Um, I don't know what I would have done if I didn't go on that page every single day. Like it was like my safe place. Um, and I found out what I needed through there because doctors really and doctors are so great and they're so wonderful, but they kind of just didn't get this. Like they just didn't get it. I was so upset when I went to the neurologist because he was just kind of like, you got to live with this. And for people that have this, you it's, it's like you're going crazy. Um, you're living with this sound in your ear constantly. Like I can't even, it's, it was so hard to even just describe. It was just your heartbeat is in your ear 24 seven. And then it usually isn't just that, like you're usually suffering through headaches and all the things that come with it. So for people that don't have it, it was really hard to understand. And I get that. But for people that do have it, it makes you feel like you're not crazy. You know that you're hearing this. Um, but once I was on the Wooshers page and there's one on Reddit and there's one on Facebook, I love the one on Facebook. Um I realized so quickly that I needed to see Dr. P and I needed to get scans and I needed to send them to him and I needed to do this like right away because I couldn't live my life like this. Um, So I ended up going, getting an appointment with Dr. P and it was May. So I ended up seeing him in July and I saw him on my birthday and I said to everybody that it was my (laughs) birthday gift that year (laughs) seeing Dr. P. Um, because I was really suffering and I think I played it off so well to those around me that I wasn't, um, because not only did doctors not get it, but people that loved me and I loved didn't get it as well. Um, you would tell them and it's called pulsatile tinnitus when you have it. And people think that it's just like the ringing in the ears and they get Mm -hmm. that too. And I get that too. So it's kind of like they didn't get it. Um, And I was also met with a lot of people saying, well, you're too young for that. Like, you can't have that. Like, it's take Tylenol, like just all these things that, and I get people had great intentions, but it was helpful. (laughs) Um, So I chose to just live that life hidden. And I didn't tell people that I was suffering. Like, really, the person I talked to the most about it was my husband. He helped me the most. I didn't tell people because I was like, I was already feeling horrible when people tell me, Oh, I get that too. It's like, it's just, it does, it's not helpful. Or they would say, okay, how is it today? And those that have it, no, it never gets better (laughs) unless you get it fixed. Um, so it, I chose to like isolate that myself instead of educating other people on it. I chose to say, you know, I'm not even going to tell people, I'm just going to live this life and I'm going to act like everything's fine. And I did that for about a year and I couldn't do it anymore. I, I couldn't do it anymore. Um, it was really hard. But before I saw Dr. P, um, I knew I needed scans. And living in New York, I knew that I was in the state that Dr. P was in. So if I didn't come to him with all the scans, he would still be able to get like prescribed Mm -hmm. me. Um, But still, I wanted to go in with something. Um, So I ended up going to an ENT. 
as well as the neurologist. So the MRI came back fine. There wasn't anything wrong with my arteries. And then the neurologist didn't want to see me anymore. So um, I ended up going to an ENT and I haven't been to an ENT at the time. So this was a brand new doctor. And he was the one that said that I needed to go and see an ophthalmologist right away. So he kind of knew what it what what it was. Huh. He get it fully, but he was just like, okay, I've heard of this and you need to see an ophthalmologist within 24 hours. And that completely freaked me out because I was like, oh my gosh. And that's when I learned about something called IIH, which a lot of people have um, when they have pulsatile tinnitus. It's, um, can you say, it's the, when spinal, cerebral spinal fluid builds up. But it's a syndrome of high intracranial pressure. High pressure, yeah. Caused by idiopathic intracranial hypertension. So many patients with venous stenosis that they have passatile tinnitus, there can be a spectrum that they also have high intracranial pressure, which includes vision changes, headaches. So that's the reason to see an ophthalmologist if that's a you know a suspicion. Yeah. Um. He he really didn't say much other than you need to go see an ophthalmologist right away. Um, and then he said something which like really made me go into, but he was like, you could go blind from this. So you need to actually go and get this, see an ophthalmologist right, right away. Um, and I've heard of IIH uh, from the Wooshers page, but I, I didn't really think anything of it. Like I just knew I, cause I didn't realize that all of my symptoms were together. Like I got these headaches, but I didn't, correlate it all. I didn't just mush it all in one. Like I, they were all very standalone to me. And what I wanted to get taken care of was my pulsatile tinnitus. So I wasn't even thinking I had that. Um, I ended up seeing an ophthalmologist the next day and um, I got my optic nerve t tested and that came back inconclusive uh, twice. So, <laughs> so I was like, okay, well, he well I, I was reviewing your chart. So sorry yeah. to interrupt you because I was just reviewing everything this morning. And it was more like barely abnormal versus normal. It was just like a questionable whether it was like, you know, small amount of swelling of the optic nerve. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, that it didn't help make me feel better that he kept he said <laughs> it was inconclusive. I was like, I don't know what that means. Um, he put me on Diamox and that that made me feel crazy like I was going crazy that did not make me feel good whatsoever Diamox was like the devil for me um I really didn't like being on it and I stopped it and it didn't help anything that I was even on it um so I didn't I didn't stay on that however um I did from the ENT end up getting an an MRI um, he also tested my ears, like my auditory, everything like that, just to make sure it was nothing like that. But I took both the MRA and the MRI to Dr. P and just that first meeting, um, you were able to see that I had a very narrowed, um, vein. Correct. And that was I'm... amazing. <laughs> no, I, I, I thought you brought up a couple of good points and I'll, I'll give you some time to rest by kind of like highlighting a couple of things like the social aspect right this is difficult for families and friends because they want to help as you say want to be nice but they don't know what it is and they confuse it with ringing or the regular tinnitus or you know high pitch sounds that all the patients often get then the physicians don't, don't learn this in medical school and then it's very difficult to teach a physician something that they haven't been exposed to already it's this is like a you know obviously I have many friends and, you know, we're physicians and, you know, this is not general, but the physicians in general are conservative minds and they, it's very difficult to accept something that is completely new as a medical knowledge, as a patient workup, as a, you know, a new disease, new diagnosis. So that's, you know, that's getting much better. But, you know, uh, I think patients who had this problem 10 years ago is much more difficult to find someone who, who even understand what they are discussing compared to now. But there's a lot more work to be done. And then the third thing is like, you know, incomplete knowledge can be bad for two reasons. It can be bad because you get over scared 
or you get over worried and you tell the patient, oh no, this is something that is so bad that it's not going to go away. And as you said, you have to live with this, et cetera, et cetera. Or it can be at the other end. It's like, don't worry about it. You know, my neighbor has it and, you know, my uncle has this and I had another patient last week and don't worry about it. And that's, that's equally bad, right? But these are kind of, you know, the story highlights this, these aspects that we see like you know, every day. Um, then the the other point I want to make is that that you know you already highlighted this you know discuss everybody deserves good quality imaging because the first objective is to exclude life threatening problems that can manifest with the heartbeat sound in the ear with the whooshing sound in the ear and the second objective is to find find this, uh, the cause even if it's not a life threatening problem. Because for some patients, if it's debilitating, then we can offer treatments. Um, and uh, that is, that's a lot of resistance sometimes getting somebody to prescribe these scans, like the MRA, the MRI, and the MRV. Um, and the third point I want to make, which you didn't mention, is like, you know, the quality of the sound is important. So you describe, you hear your heart is like typically like a low pitch wishing mm -hmm. sound. But in, especially if it's related to venous stenosis, when you press on the, in the jugular vein in the neck, that you expect that sound to diminish or go away. And this is something you experienced, right? Yeah, I would be able to press here and I would get relief. I would also be able to press on the other side and get relief. Um, I tended to sleep with my hand on my neck. Okay. Um, so that was like eight hours of that, which I realized probably wasn't the best. Thing. Not the best idea. For <laughs> yeah, <no. laughs> um, but that was really that was relief for me. Was that was the only relief that I could get was pressing on my neck and falling asleep with that on my neck. And then the correlation between, you know, passatile tinnitus and and intracranial hypertension, which is, you know, I think the best way to uh, explain this is that venous stenosis or venous sinus stenosis to be more more specific has um, a spectrum of symptoms and you can have passatile tinnitus without any hypertension any intracranial hypertension or you can have passatile tinnitus and intracranial hypertension uh, which is a more concerning situation because this can lead to visual problems and, and vision loss at, at you know in extreme situations but um um so my 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 re recommendation the way you know kelly and i practice is that any patient with venous stenosis we actually screen for uh, visual problems that indicate intracranial hypertension even if they deny the typical symptoms which is like blurry vision double vision uh transient loss of vision the this is called transient visual obscuration. Um, these are like the the, high, the the most common symptoms of visual changes from intracranial hypertension. So even if a patient does not have these symptoms, we, we still mandate uh, ophthalmological examination to at least know for sure what's going on. Then you mentioned the headaches and the feeling of pressure. Right? This is also part of the spectrum where, you know, let's say at the most severe end of the spectrum, you can have headaches and vision changes uh, and passatile tinnitus, and this all goes into the intracranial hypertension syndrome. But you can also be in between where you have passatile tinnitus and headaches that don't necessarily qualify you for the IIH condition, but these are also headaches related to, you know, intracranial pressure. And like, Again, you know, these numbers that exist in, in, in the medical literature that the opening pressure should be 25. Yes, this is like, <clears throat> excuse me, like a criterion. But, you know, for another patient, like an opening pressure of 20 or 22 could be enough to stimulate headaches, even if it's not enough to check the criteria of, of IIH. These headaches typically, and I'm going to ask you if this is what you felt, these headaches are typically worse at night when patients lie in bed. So when you lie flat, the, the intracranial pressure goes up, just like, you know, uh, 
uh, fluid dynamics in our body. Uh, so typically patients who have headaches related to venous stenosis and pressure, uh, these headaches wake them up in the middle of the night or their worst time of the day is when they wake up in the morning because it doesn't happen they've been flat for six, seven, eight hours. And then they get better as patients are like up and, and, and about. So what, what type of headaches did you have? Um, my headaches were predominantly in the evening. So when I would get home from work, um, when I would at night for the most part, they would be pretty bad. Um, I would always wake up with like an ache in my head, um, and always wake up a pressure. But again, I didn't, I wish I paid more attention to how often it was because I just didn't think it was related. So it was looking back, it was it was really frequent that I would wake up with an ache in my head. Um, I would go to bed with, you know, a, either a small or a big headache. And I would always have one at the end of the day, um, whether it was mild or something that I needed to take Tylenol for. Okay. Very good. Um, so now we are like at the time where we, we met, we made a diagnosis of venous sinus stenosis. That was like, I think, a few months after you started having passatile tinnitus. Yes. yes um, How did you feel then? Um, so Dr. P basically told me about the procedure, the stenting procedure, um, told me that you he didn't know how many stents it would need or coils and just uh, we'll see when we kind of get in there thing. Um, there would be an awake part and there would be a part where you um, go to sleep. And I was I was scared of hearing that. I like, wish you never met me. <laughs> I, I didn't like it, but I knew I I knew that it was something that I would ha I would have if I really wanted to. And I think it took me it took a lot of self convincing to even just get there to make the appointment for the procedure. Um, my, the ENT after my MRI, he, he saw the MRI as well. And he was basically like, okay, the radiologist doesn't see anything. So I want to give you a CT of your temporal bone. And, um, I didn't want that. Um, I was confident with what Dr. P said, and I knew that this was my issue. I think it was just getting there to schedule the procedure was something that I was really having a lot of anxiety about. Um, I'm not a go with the flow type of person. Like I need to know what every single second is going to look like for me. I need to know from the minute I get there to the minute I wake up, I need to know, am I going to wake up? What is going to happen? What am I going to hear? What it was, what am I going to feel? Um, so I did a ton of my own research on what this could look like. And I'm also a person that just a very anxious personality where I will go and look up all the journals about all the deaths that have happened. So I just was not a go with the flow person. And I had full trust in Dr. P and Kelly. I it would and it wasn't that. It was just I was so nervous. Like you just get nervous because you're out of control here in the situation. Um so I went back and forth and I eventually settled. It was so May was the first time I had the pulsatile tinnitus mm -hmm. settled on a December procedure date. And I was like, okay, I'm going to do it in December when I'm off for Christmas break. It's going to be great. Um, and I would go back and forth every single day. I would go back and forth. I'd say, I don't want to feel the awake part. And then I would say to my husband, like, I'm fine today. And the next day I wake up and I'd be like, oh, well, I'm miserable today. And I was never fine. Um, but November that year of 2022 came around and it was one month to the procedure date. And I was like, yeah, that's not happening. So I called up to cancel. Um, and my husband and I always go to where we got married. So we go, we got married in Bar Harbor, Maine. We always go to the mountain that we got married on. And that year I was climbing the mountain with him, just like I did the previous year when we got married. And I felt like I couldn't do it because my head hurt so bad. And I had the sound was even worse on the mountain. And I remember saying to myself, like, I just did this last year. I'm only I was 24. I was only 24. Like, I couldn't. I couldn't climb this mountain. It, like, what is wrong with me? Like, this is so upset. And I didn't want to tell him because I felt so embarrassed. Because why is this? This is because I'm overweight. This is just all these things. So 
I was so upset. And I think that made me realize that you can't live like you're only in your 20s. What part of you thinks that you're going to make it oh, your whole life with this? So that was the deciding thing for me where I was like, OK, I'm scheduling this now and I'm not going to cancel this again, um, though I never that, you know, <laughs> I still wanted to cancel it every single day. Um, instead of December, I did cancel December one. I rescheduled it again for June of 2023. So that would have been a year and a month that I was experiencing the pulsatile tinnitus. And I scheduled it again for June. I wanted to cancel every single day, but I, I didn't. And that experience was really tough because again, I was kind of suffering through this alone, which was my choice. Um, I could have had people support me, but I was like, you know what? I, I was so unwell physically. Like I just didn't feel good physically that I was like, people aren't going to get it. They're going to be skeptical of it. Um, there's just no point in telling people that I'm going through this. So I was really going through this alone. And again, the only person that was understanding it because I was telling him every single day was, was my husband, but that was my choice. Um, if I could go back, I would get all the support I could because that was the wrong choice because people shouldn't be going through this without telling anybody. And plus you get to educate them. And I just didn't want to do that because I was just miserable in my own right. So I couldn't take that on. But, um, up until the day that I, it was really, it, I really did want to can't up until the day I started the five days before you have to start mm -hmm. Alex and aspirin. Um, I want to say it was like up until that point that it was really up in the air. And it was like the day that I took the Plavix and aspirin, I was like, okay, there's like, no, you're not taking this for no reason. Like there is no going back now. Um, but I had so, and I see a therapist every week. I've been doing that for five years now. Um, nothing was helping the anxiety, nothing watching these webinars wasn't help. It was just like, it was great to hear. But it was just like you're when you're all you're your own person. It just doesn't doesn't. Right. Um, I was really the most nervous for the awake part. Like I was like, I am so I don't want to feel something go through me being awake. Like how like it was just it was so scary to me. Um, and I cried like a baby, a big baby the whole the, throughout the whole thing. Um, but again, if I could go back, I wouldn't have done that. <laughs> So how was your experience that day? Um, it was it was actually really quick and very pleasant. Um, it took me a lot to get there. I was I live about an hour from mm -hmm. um, where you would get the procedure. So just driving an hour there, I was obviously and I I really did a disservice to my husband, too, because I was just constantly telling him like, oh, something bad's going to happen today. So he was also. Yeah. Not that he was, uh, but I was making him so nervous because I was just like, oh my gosh, something horrible is going to happen. And he's just like, why would you keep saying this? Um, but I ended up getting there and with, I got there at 10 and within an hour I was ready to go in. So the whole process was very, very quick. Um, once I was in the operating room, um, I got pushed every type of like sedative, like just calm down medicine that I could get, but it really wasn't helping. Um, I was in full tears. However, there was this like amazingly bright part of my day. Her name was Laura. Um, I love her. I could cry every time I think about her. Um, she explained every single thing that was going to happen. She was holding my hand and just being the best person in the world for me. Um, I just remember going in, people were strapping down my arm, my leg, um, and I was really just freaking out. And to have Laura just explain, she before we went in, she explained every single part to me. And she even said, like, she she's never been through this, but she knows that it might feel like just a little uncomfortable going up, you know, the side of your body and you might feel something or you might feel like a tickle. Um, and I really was building myself up for that awake part. Like I was freaking out about that part. Um, and it ended up starting and 
it happens and I don't feel anything. Like it's completely fine. Um, I made it worse than it had to be. I really did make it worse than it had to be. And even as that awake part was happening, like just the tears were just streaming down my face, like no tomorrow. And I even said this to Dr. P at my year appointment. Um, he came in to measure the pressures and I was just bawling. And he would just look at me and he's like, why are you crying? Like I had no clue why I was crying. And I was just like, oh, no, no, no. I just couldn't, I couldn't take, like he had no clue why I was crying. I was just like, it really wasn't a big, it didn't hurt. It didn't hurt. It was a little bit uncomfortable. You can kind of hear it a little bit when it goes up. It just wasn't, it wasn't bad. It wasn't bad at all. And he did such a good job at, at making me feel better. And he updated my husband like three times because he started freaking out after I left because I was feeding him all these horrible oh. things. Um, <laughs> so if I could really, if I could do it again, I, I would do it again 50 times. If that meant I didn't have pulsatile tinnitus anymore, I would do it again in a heartbeat. It wasn't, it would just wasn't bad. I woke up and the, it really even like the headache wasn't that bad. It was just like, I woke up and I was like, no whoosh. And I was a mess. Um, but I woke up and that was like the first thing I said, I didn't hear the sound anymore. Um, and little did I know just, and you think you're going to feel so bad after it, but I walked up the stairs to my apartment that day, that night going home. And I had no head pressure when I got up those stairs, I had no sound. I didn't feel bad at all. Like I, from that day, I realized that I was suffering so badly and more than I even knew. Um, I just didn't put it together. Like I just chose to ignore it, but I was suffering so bad. And just that day was made my life change. Like I can't even explain it. Like I'm just a different person. So thank you. <laughs> That's it. No, our pleasure. <laughs> No, thanks for letting us take care of you, first of all. Um, you mentioned Laura. Laura Patruno is a physician assistant that works with me in the hospital setting. And yes, yeah, she's amazing. Basically, exactly oh what you God. described. Just the this best like, person yes, it's ever. A, it's I God's, God's gift to patients. Yes. <laughs> um, yes. so, yeah. Oh, my gosh. And it was right around the 4th of July. She's like, you can talk to me anytime. Like, she was just the best. Like she cared so much about what I was, what, what was happening to me, even the next day, the next week, um, a month from then I reached out, like just texted her. She was just so amazing. And that made a lot of the difference too, because if I had somebody that I couldn't talk to like that, I think that would have, you know, made me feel worse, but I was able to talk to her and ask her questions. And she just let me know every single thing that was going yeah, on. Exceptional, exceptional. Um, and oh. really the after was was phenomenal. What they don't, what people warn you about the headache and on the Wooshers page, everybody talks mm -hmm. about the headache you get after. The headache was okay. I was totally manageable. It was like Tylenol and I was good. Um, the arm pain was so bad for me. And I think that's what people don't realize is that like the radial arm. Like, okay, yeah. Oh man, I was bruised from here to here. And it was just like, I had a hard time using my hand but that was like what I wasn't prepared for um was the hand pain but I again I would take I would take worse than that if it meant that I could live like this I'll, I'll touch on a couple of points number one the awake part the awake part is is important and I've been you know, I've been treating patients like you for you know almost 15 years now but um and I I still think that the awake part is important because that gives you kind of like the the confirmation that the stem is going to work. Because I think it's a disservice to to put a stem in a twenty year old or twenty four year old or you know any patient, but especially young women, um, without having the kind of like this ninety nine percent certainty that this is going to take care of the problem. I think if we take away the awake part, which makes the procedure more convenient, makes it faster, and patients don't have to stress about the awake part like, like you did, which really never ends up being a problem, but 
it's easy for me to say, but I understand why the patients are anxious about it. Um, but if we take away that part, um, and and this happens in other places, for the reasons I, I mentioned, I think you you increase significantly the likelihood that you're gonna uh, not understand which patients the stent is not gonna help, and then you're gonna implant stents without any benefit. And for me, you know, I I prefer to, you know, take the patient through the, you know, the journey with stress about the awake part rather than you know, make it easier for everybody to let them get, you know, get out of the awake part. But then we're going to deal with patients who end up with stents and no benefit. And I think that's worse. So that's, but again, like what you experienced is many patients are anxious. Many patients, you know, are afraid that they're going to feel every little, you know, movement. But the reality is that it's very, very rare that they feel anything more than that, some pressure or some tickling or some, and I always give them the heads up and they expect it. And, you know, nobody has had any issues. In terms of the post-procedure headaches, there is, there's two reasons patients have like headaches after the procedure. One is that um, the, the these veins in the brain are supposed to veins like in the arms, legs, they have nerves around them. So anything that stretches this vein, anything that, um, you know, put some force in this vein, like a stand when, when it's opening up, will cause some kind of pain. The second reason is that, you know, the veins are designed to be soft, you know, structures that are, you know, shaped like a tube, but again, they're like very soft and uh, easy to manipulate. When you put a stand, you make this like more rigid because the stand is metallic. So depending on the type of stent, depending on the size of the stent, the length, you can make the vein too rigid and then you cause a lot more headache. So like in my practice, I try to sort of like keep this um, uh, minimal irritation to the vein by choosing the right stent. Um, you know, sometimes it's better to, instead of using one long stent to use like two shorter stents and Kind of like recreate the anatomy of the vein instead of like having like a like a straight tube you have one straight part and then the other part curves down so these are things i try to do over time to minimize the post-procedure headache so i'm glad that for you was not a big problem and the last thing the punctures um whether they're in the groin or or the wrist typically you need two punctures for for venous stenting like, like a venous puncture which over years i concluded that is better if it's in the leg because the alternative is like the the upper arm and in the upper arm you always cause some bruising in the muscles and then the moving the arm becomes very painful so to me the femoral vein in the upper leg is safer and more convenient for the patient and in terms of the artery i you know for many years now i conclude that the radial artery is better compared to the femoral artery, both can cause like some type, some bruising and irritation and, and um, you know, discomfort. And as you said, you know, limiting your mobility for, for uh, a few days, a week, um, which is not common, but, but it happens. Um, but again, you know, on the balance of things, the radial artery remains in my view and my practice a safer option, especially for patients who are going to travel quickly, you know, somebody flies here, will fly back two, three days later. Um, you, you know, having a, a femoral artery incision um, and going through an airport or a long drive um, is, is, is not ideal. So that's, you know, there's no, no, nothing is perfect, but I think just to give you my, my, my thought process here. So you went home, you felt well. Yeah. Um, I, I felt fine. It was really, it was a week and I was, my headache was good. It, it subsided more and more every single day. Um, and it really wasn't even too bad to begin with. Um, I want to say like the wrist pain lasted the longest, mm -hmm. but that again, wasn't anything that I couldn't 
deal with. Like it was, it was like, I, again, I would just, I would go through it a thousand times worse just to get out what I, what I got. I, my whooshing sound, I've never heard a whoosh again and I'm so grateful for it. And I feel every single day for the people that continue to hear that because it is the worst. It's just the worst. It's the worst living with that 24 seven. So um, to, for that, no eye floaters, not one. Um, I even went back to my ophthalmologist recently to check my mm. optic nerve. And something that I didn't even share was that um, before I even got the procedure, a month or two before, um, I saw for my yearly appointment with my ophthalmologist and he checked the optic nerve again. Again, it was inconclusive, which I didn't, I wasn't surprised about, but I was explaining to him that I was going to get this procedure and what it was. Um, and he was the one that basically he, he gave me like an even bigger scare where he was saying that I've never heard of that. What you need is a shunt. You don't need that. You can't get like something. I can't believe that a doctor would stent a 24 year old girl like this. Um, and I had so much trust in Dr. P that I was just like, well, it's happening. So, um, like it was just, so I really dealt with a lot of every single thing before that heightened my anxiety. Like I was just having constant interactions and constant things that were just popping up that I was like, oh, well, something's going to happen to me. But again, it was just the best thing I could have done for myself. I felt like a new person. I had the best school year. Like I was able to do my job better because I had this and I wasn't depressed. Um, my anxiety got better. I just feel better overall. I don't really get headaches anymore. If I do, it's like one a month, like if that, um, everything just was resolved. So I, I wish I didn't put myself through what I put myself through, but I needed to do that for me, I guess. <laughs> um, if I could go back, I, I would do it all. De people deserve support and it's not your job to educate people, but at the same time, if you want people to get the support, they need to understand what you're going through. And that was one of my bigger mistakes. So I'm happy to be able to do this now and hopefully more people understand it and get what it means to have pulsatile tinnitus and how to treat it. Very good. No. Thank you. So I'm glad, I'm glad you, um, you highlighted a lot of the issues that many patients go through, like the social aspect, the procedure anxiety, you know, the post-procedure, you know, headaches, wrist pain, leg pain, whatever it is. Um, you know, because some people have actually bad headache afterwards. So I'm not going to deny that. Um, but um, at the end of the day, I think it's... Uh, it's one of these conditions that, of course, is not like in your case. Thankfully, was not a life-threatening problem. You know, it was like a, it was not. It's not an arterial disease. It was like a venous disease. So the decision to treat is based on the quality of life. Right? It's, if, if this was not bothersome, we could just leave it alone and see how things go. And that's you know, you made the decision according to how much it impacted your your quality of life at the end of the day. Um, and also, you know, you know, I cannot measure the past tinnitus. It's like back pain. You know, you tell me it's good, okay. You tell me it's very bad, okay. Also, like this is, I have, to, I have to rely on the patient. There are some, some rare situations where, you know, with a with, with specific microphones, you can actually pick up the sound and and measure the intensity. But the reality is that for even with the most sophisticated equipment, the majority of patients, this is subjective. Uh, symptom. So it does, you know, regardless of how the scans look, we have to rely on the patient. And um, it's a self-reported syndrome uh, symptom. The and that also puts more responsibility on the physicians because if we're treating somebody for quality of life, we have to provide very good treatment, very safe treatment. We, can, we should not take any risks. We should know what we are doing, and we should not like be casual about it, because again, we are not treating a life-threatening problem that you are, let's say, not allowed, but is reasonable to do 
a high risk treatment for a life threatening problem. We, we deal with this, you know, on, on a daily basis. But for venous sinus stenosis and passive tinnitus, we have to be very, very, very careful. Right indication, right patient, confirm that this is the right treatment and, and then execute it in a way that, you know, it's as safe as possible. Some questions? Sure. Yeah, you um, you actually kind of just touched on this, but if a patient has pulsatile tinnitus only, um, and they don't, and they decide not to go through with stenting or surgery, can one live safely with this condition, or is there any danger or risk to just living with this? What did I tell you when we met about this? Do you remember? That you could. That you... If, if we didn't treat you, how would your life be? Did you, you remember this discussion or? No. No. Okay. Uh, I think you just. I remember you saying that you could live with this. If Correct. Want. Correct. If if this if the symptom is tolerable, you can you can you don't have to do anything. However, there are there is a risk that you may progress mm -hmm. to the intracranial hypertension syndrome over time, regardless of weight gain or weight loss. Just purely with time, you can progress from what it, what I described as isolated passatile tinnitus, meaning passatile tinnitus from venous stenosis without any high pressure. You can progress over time to uh, the high pressure syndrome. So patients who do not get treatment, they, are, they don't have risk. They, they, are, they are not at risk for stroke. They are not at risk for a life-threatening problem, but they are at risk for to develop IIH. And so for these patients, I recommend you know, annual ophthalmological exams to make sure nothing is getting worse in terms of vision. And I also recommend that they come back to see me if the symptoms change. And and I hope that answers this. And I hope I told you the same thing like before. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Jillian, this question's for you. Which imaging showed that you had the narrowed vein and was it imaging that your care team prior to Dr. Patsalidi said was normal? Um, so I had an MRI and an MRA and both radiologists through Zwanger Pasiri said that it was normal. Um, everything was unremarkable. Um, and then once I brought them both to Dr. P, I believe that he said that he could see the narrowing through the MRI. Um, and that's when he went ahead and gave me the MRV. Probably I saw it on the contrast scan, on the post-contrast scans of the MRI that do show the veins. But the ideal test is the MRV. Correct. This is a, a little more like an IIH type question. Mm -hmm. But the question is, can venous sinus stenosis cause pressure headaches in the absence of high pressure? The answer is yes. Um, this is a little controversial still because the medical books are, you know, absolute about that, that for headaches, you need to have high intracranial pressure. But we, we now know that there is a gray area of what we think as normal intracranial pressure, which for some patients is higher than they can tolerate. So... The answer is yes. What is called normal intracranial pressure can actually cause uh, headaches uh, related to intracranial hypertension, even if it doesn't meet the specific criteria of IIH. Anyone else have any questions? You can type them in. Some of the questions are about like individual symptoms and travel and locations. I think we'll take those probably offline. Um, but any other general questions for Jillian or Dr. Pat's ladies? Okay. Jillian, thank you again for taking the time and, you know, for a very, you know, uh, honest and, you know, from the heart you know, description of your of your uh, journey with us. I think that uh, these are very valuable for for patients and for some patients need encouragement. Some patients need to hear 
you know that other people have as you said that other people have the same problems or have the same symptoms um and I, and what i also think is important is many patients go to their physicians with information from these webinars or from the support groups or uh, you know, from other patients directly, and they say, "Look, can we get this scan? Can we check for this? Can you do this for me?" And you know, I think, I think at the end of the day, there are many ways these things help. And I thank you for taking the time to do this. Um, and this will be on YouTube eventually, also for people to you know see you know at their leisure. I'll leave the last comment to you. Thank you for having me. I really do appreciate it. I really feel like I didn't, uh, I felt like it was my job to like educate people after I had this because I did such a horrible job with it when I actually had it. I didn't share about it. And I just realized that that's what people need is to hear that it's going to be okay. And that there's treatment options if you could get them and it'll, you'll be okay. Don't do what I did. <laughs> so thank you for having me. Be well. Enjoy the rest of the summer. School starts in two, three weeks. Mm -hmm. So um, enjoy your the rest of the time off. And uh, again, thank you. This is this is thank important. Yeah. Thank you guys for having me. And, and thanks to Good everybody. Good you. Thanks to everybody who's been watching and asking questions. Take care. Bye.